Uh, hi everyone. I hope you have a good uh, lunch break. So next speaker is uh, Mr. Michael Delfino. His uh, talk is teaching and learning with Python. Thank you. Hey, welcome everyone. Um, as mentioned, my talk is entitled Teaching and Learning with Python. Um, so what basically what this is going to be about is either for a time that you teach someone else uh, programming, computer science, that could be as a mentor role uh, or as a teacher. Do we have any educators in the room? Okay. Oh, well, yeah. Um, but I figured the majority of the audience could be more uh, learners. So this talk will be aimed both at people who teach, but also people who are learning, which is hopefully everyone all the time, right? Okay. So who am I? Um, I am a teacher from the United States, from Kentucky. Uh, you can see I attended the University of Kentucky. I initially studied computer science. Um, so I didn't start off as a teacher. started off as a software and firmware engineer. Did that for a few years. Uh, decided to go back to school, get a master's in education, and start teaching the subject. So I teach computer science. I did so for two years in the US. Um, but now I teach at an international school here in Thailand, at the British Columbia International School of Bangkok. Um, yeah. So first, why is Python a good, good tool uh, for learning and for teaching? My first experience with education was while I was still studying computer science as a student. I was a teaching assistant at the University of Kentucky. During that time, uh, we made a transition. We originally had been using C++ as our programming language uh, to teach the intro level computer programming course. Uh, we decided to consider some other options to update our curriculum, and Python was the top contender, so we kind of had a, a debate internally about what would be the best language to uh, go with. And we did decide on going with Python. Here are some of the reasons why. Uh, for one, whenever you're learning, it's important to have a very strong feedback loop. When you do something wrong, you need to know as soon as possible to get that feedback so you know to make changes to adjust to try something new. Uh, so the fact that Python, inherently by being an interpreted language over a compiled language like C++, you can get that feedback much faster. You're not recompiling a program in between uh, each iteration of attempting your solution to your problem. Hey, also the syntax lends itself well to an educational setting. Um, if I tried to describe a hello world program to you in Python, I could do it. I could just tell you it's print hello world. Uh, pretty straightforward. You might need to explain why you have to include quotation marks or parentheses in Python 3, but that's pretty baseline. If I were to explain the same program in C++, well, there's a lot of overhead there. You know, you have your headers, you're declaring, you're creating a function called main. We don't even know what functions are yet if we're just starting to learn. Um, so you either have to do a lot of hand waving, say ignore this for now, or you have to explain way too much and it doesn't really make sense. You have to do all that just to print a simple message to the screen. Okay. You also, um, you know, there are benefits to using different languages like C over Python. For one, explicit uh, memory management that you can't do in Python. But when we're trying to get at higher level concepts, uh, especially as we do with people who are just starting to learn, then this is a benefit. Okay. Also, it's a popular language, and popularity alone is not a reason to use a language, but the fact that it's popular means there's a large community around it, lots of resources online, uh, lots and lots of tools to do cool things. Right? Um, we still teach C++ in later courses uh, at the university level, but the fact that you get exposed to something like Python, then you learn another language like C++, makes it easier to realize there are lots of different tools uh, when we're creating projects. Uh, and if I give you a few tools out of the gate, then you're more likely to be able to understand 
that we can go be between, make choices, and knowing that I can use multiple tools is always uh, an empowering feeling for learners or doers. Okay, but we're at PyCon, we're talking about Python, so uh, we probably are all convinced that Python's a pretty good language uh, in general, but also when it comes to learning new concepts in computer science or in programming. Okay. So how can we use Python to learn even better though? One big one, uh, I mentioned that feedback loop and how you can get feedback from your code uh, to help you make changes. Well, we can make that feedback loop even stronger. Um, one way to do that is test-driven development, which has you uh, beginning to write your tests before you write your working code uh, so that that feedback is even stronger, even faster. And also, learning about learning. This isn't specific to Python, but just in general, when you're learning new things, if you learn how to learn, you're gonna be even better at it. So I'm gonna spend a bulk of this talk going over uh, learning, uh, since that's my field right now, uh, education. Um, and you can apply this to Python, but really any aspect of your life where you wanna learn something new. Uh, I've only included one slide here on test-driven development. This is something we could give an entire talk on, so I won't go too much into it. Um, but as I mentioned, we have a process where we start off writing tests. Unlike most process, well, not most, unlike some traditional processes where you begin writing code to function out of the gate and then you write your tests maybe later as an afterthought if you have time at all, Test-driven development really emphasizes the importance of those tests by putting them up front. You figure out how you're gonna test before you start your implementation. Then you write your code to make it work. Rerun all your tests, make sure it's still working. Then you're gonna refactor, uh, decide mm, what else am I gonna implement. Before I do that, let me write new tests. Uh, in the education world, we have something like this too. It's called backward design. Uh, when you plan lessons or you, you're thinking about teaching someone something, you don't first just think of what the content is, start laying out your, you know, whatever you're gonna do to teach them. You think first, what are the goals? Uh, what are the big ideas I'm trying to uh, instill here or, or to impart? How am I gonna assess that learning? How will we know if we reach those goals? And then I'll come up with my approach, my lesson plan or whatever it is, the activity you have. So this idea, um, I'm sure other domains have these ideas as well. Okay. As I mentioned though, I'm here to talk more about the learning about learning aspect. Why should we learn about learning? Even if you're not an educator in the education space. Um, I've already mentioned here, thinking about thinking makes you better at thinking. And we all wanna be better at thinking because then we can be better at doing things. Okay. Um, and there's also some studies to back up the fact that if we have a certain mindset about learning, it can, it can boost achievement, right? I feel like sometimes we might think, I'm good at this and I'm not good at that. I'm a, I'm a this kind of person. You know, I'm a math person or I'm not a math person, you know? Um, there's also another mindset, a growth mindset, that where I am at now with my current abilities is not a fixed point. It's something that can be changed. Now, we can't all be good at everything, but if we uh, take the time to grow in certain areas, we can get better at almost any specific thing that we want to grow in. Just a, a little, to give you an idea of the difference between a, a growth mindset, as I just mentioned, and a more fixed mindset, uh, you can ask yourself, how do I view things like challenges and obstacles? Are these things that make me just stop what I'm doing? I say, well, no, I can't do that. I'm not that kind of person. Or do you view them as an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to push your abilities uh, to a greater level? Okay. Yeah. Give you a second.
there's this notion too that um, cleverness is something that we, we all value and I think it's a good thing. But I think it's important to value effort and the hard work you put into solving problems over some kind of innate uh, intelligence or being smart. You might look at someone's code and be like, whoa, I would never have thought to do it that way. It's so like short and concise, like, but they're a smart person and I'm just someone who has to hack away. Well, they've probably done things not in an elegant way before. Cleverness is something that you can build, right? Just do something and work hard at it and work hard at learning and growing. And eventually you build those intuitions you need to be able to do those things in a more clever way the first time. But if you're always realizing, I'm where I am right now, but I can keep going further, then you'll get more and more clever over time. Okay. It's a big concept in education, uh, and probably all of us know this or have thought about it, but maybe not have had the language to express it. There's something called the zone of proximal development. Right? There's, there's some small set of tasks, which this is kind of watched out. There's actually a small circle right here in the slide. There's a small set of things that like, you can do without any help. I don't have to open up Stack Exchange or do anything. I can just type this, do it, easy peasy. There's also stuff that I don't really know how to do. Even if you, you told me how to do it, and you're like, oh, you just do this, this, and this. I'm like, I don't know what those words mean. You know, I don't know how to do that. Uh, where you want to be to optimize your learning is this area that's just outside of what you can already do. You want to be doing things that are just outside your current level of capability. Right? You've mastered things already. And good, you'll do those things. But you want to always try something new. Once you've mastered a set, just be like, oh, I'm, I'm a this kind of person. I, I work just on databases, right? But I have, no, I have no idea how UI works. I'll just let someone always do that. I'll always sit and work on my database. But you can do more than what you currently specialize in. Not that it's a bad thing to specialize. But if your reason for not doing things is you believe you can't, well, then it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You won't be able to if you keep telling yourself you can't. Always be pushing just beyond your current ability. Now, there is stuff that's way out there that maybe won't be productive to try yet, but. And that could lead to feelings of frustration, right? If you try things that are way outside your comfort zone, which is another way of phrasing this, uh, it can be really frustrating because you'll try something over and over and there's stuff that you don't even know you don't know yet. And that can lead to tons of frustration. Um, but also if you do the same stuff over and over, stuff that you've mastered, you'll probably get really bored really fast. So by being in this middle zone, this zone of proximal development, that's where you're struggling a little, but it's productive struggle. You're trying something, it doesn't work the first time, you figure something out, now it works, you go back and forth, uh, that leads you to having higher capabilities or more capabilities than you had before, and you maybe had some fun doing it, because it wasn't the same stuff that you've been doing over and over. And one good thing, we've got our growth mindset, these circles in the middle, they keep getting bigger and bigger. Because something that's a fun, productive struggle right now might become easier and easier the more you do it. Then some of this stuff out here comes into your zone of proximal development. Some of that stuff that seemed really, really hard doesn't anymore. I've also taught math, so I teach calculus. But whenever my, you know, grade nine algebra one students come in and they still see the slides up I have from calculus, they're like, oh, that looks really intimidating. I don't ever wanna do that. But they stay with me for three or four years and we slowly incrementally build those skills and then we go through calculus like, oh, that's easy. Why was I afraid of all that stuff before? Right, because these change, hopefully. That was a bunch of stuff about education uh, and learning and that kind of stuff, pedagogy. But uh, how can we 
get better specifically in the domain of coding, programming, writing Python. Uh, there's lots of cool tools out there. And I think there's kind of two approaches that are okay. I think one's better, and I'll explain that in a minute. You can train specific skills. And there's lots of cool uh, tools out there. Uh, this washed out screenshot comes from a website called HackerRank, uh, where you're given programming challenges and you try to solve them, and you have a, a quantitative feedback system letting you know if you get it right, get it wrong. I know there was a Code War event last night, maybe a similar type of deal. You have a challenge, you write code to solve that challenge. Pretty cool. Lots of other tools out there, Top Coder or others. And well-implemented tools like this have all these um, incentives, maybe achievements, badges, things that help you feel like you're growing. You can see that, you know, like, oh, I did that. I've gotten better. I see my progress bar or whatever. It's getting bigger. The numbers are getting bigger, so I'm doing better. It's just sometimes a little psychological trick to help us keep going. Um, there's another approach, though. You could tackle some real-world applications, right? Because when I go and I try to find the intersection of two lists, right, that's a cool little challenge that can help me figure out how to do something in a particular language. Um, but it's kind of just not trivial, obviously, if I can't do it at first, but it, it's contrived, right? I won't be writing programs like that for real. So sinking your teeth into some real world programs, like making tic-tac-toe or to-do list. You might be pulling in lots of um, seemingly unrelated to uh, topics to be able to pull that off, right? Um, there's this other approach of just knowing topics you need to learn and doing them in order. That's good, that's not bad. But I just think these real world applications are a little more effective in storing them in our brain and, and building those skills. Uh, an example, you know, I'm learning the Thai language. And I feel like a really common approach when you're learning a new language and you're trying to build a vocabulary, uh, you kind of break them into categories, like, oh, I need to learn animals. So I'm gonna learn all these different animals. Ma, wua, guy, mao. I can learn more and more animals, and that's, that's cool, but I'll probably forget, and there's lots of need like space repetition tools and stuff like that to help put those in your brain. But when you think of some real world context and you have a context to fit that group of knowledge into, it has like an emotional impact and can be more effective. So if I try to work, learn words like this together, where I can imagine like getting bit by a dog and it hurting really bad, then I have words, my God, my mom. Like I've got an emotional response to that and they don't seem related. There's not a category I could put these words into, but they're grouped uh, based on their context. Just like when you try to tackle a program where like, you're like, oh, well, to-do list, uh, maybe I need to have an array of tasks doing this, or I need to have objects to represent a, a note that I'm gonna put into this. But you're thinking first of the context in which it takes place. So if you remember the context of the programs you've created before, then those concepts should come to you more easily without you even having to explicitly think about what is the, what's the computer science term I need for this particular thing that I'm doing. Okay, motivation is super important. If you get bored with what you're doing, you won't wanna do it anymore. And boredom can come, one, we've seen already, if something is too easy, it's boring. But it can also get too boring on the other end too. You know, things are frustrating when you're trying and not uh, succeeding, but they can also be boring if they're way above your head. You know, if I try to read uh, some academic papers on quantum physics, depending on the level, maybe there's like an intro level, like gentle intro to that. Okay, I can, I can try to make some of this out, but if it's aimed at other specialists in this field and I have no idea what's going on, I'm not engaging with that content at all, so it's boring too. So we want to uh, stay motivated, but sometimes in learning, we want the end result of knowing how to do something, but the intermediate steps might seem kind of boring. 
Um, so I think it's important to always be doing fun, cool stuff with your skills, even if they're not practical. But you've got to sometimes just buckle down and do the boring stuff too. But when you kind of build in that feedback system of like, well, I got a cool result to show for this boring stuff I did. And eventually it will become less and less boring because you become more competent at it. So it's really exciting to see the results come alive. An example for me, uh, you know, I enjoy playing video games and it's really cool. And the world of uh, machine learning, particularly the deep learning stuff that Google's come out with is kind of cool. But there's also, I don't know, some boring aspects. Uh, this is kind of a simple example here. It's just a linear regression. But it's meant to symbolize all the stuff that I could study and learn, but it's not as fun. Playing a video game or making a bot to play a video game that I really like, that's fun. So I have to go between these two things. I'm going to play the game and see what's going on. I'm going to implement my bots, uh, and I'm going to do some, say, reinforcement learning on it. If I'm going to use the DeepMind uh, API, then maybe I'm bored for a little bit, but I'm quickly going to see what happens. And when I see what happens, I'm like, oh, well, my first attempt, it does something. That's cool. I want it to be better, though. Well, now I'm motivated to go out and reach for these other things. I'm going to re need to read about more techniques. The simple stuff from the you know, tutorial I can just Google doesn't really um, work as well as it could. So I'm going to have to go more into learning the stuff that I may not have been excited about at first. Okay, Connections. Just like when we were... Uh, building neural networks, there's lots and lots of connections, right? We've based that kind of on the model of our brain. When you form more and more connections, the stronger those connections get. Uh, another example in language learning, sometimes learning more than one word at a time can actually be easier than learning one because they all associate with one another and you just formed a little network of connections in your brain instead of just trying to learn one isolated piece of information. So make connections not just in the domain you're trying to learn, but with other realms, other things that you're learning. One way that I've done that is using my programming skills and my attempt to learn, uh, learn language uh, hand in hand. So I've made some tools to help learn Thai. Right? Here's a little quiz game I made myself. How do I say Thursday in the Thai script, right? This is while I'm still learning the Thai script, so I need to uh, make these connections. Now this, the programming behind this was really simple, so I didn't really learn a lot of programming, uh, but I learned language in a way that stuck a lot quicker. This example, I also had trouble telling time in Thai, but I actually had to think through logically how it worked to write a program uh, that's pretty tough to see here. What this example is, you can input a time, and then you click how to say it in Thai. It prints out both in the Thai script and a phonetic transcription how you would say that time in Thai. But that took really thinking about the logical constructs. Well, if it's between these hours, that's you know the afternoon. If it's between these hours, it's you know. The, the early AM, which is different than the later AM hours in Thai. And finally, um, starting to make a chat bot in Thai, that when I could think of some simple constructs, like, oh, ask a question, blah, 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 my, my, blah. So I could say, I could do that, but, you know, there was a fun way to start learning, but then I thought, Oh, wow, like, to make this actually good, I've got to do a lot of things like natural language processing, which I have not done before. Like, how do you even separate the words, right? There's no spaces in Thai. So it's word segmentation. If you saw the talk earlier on, on natural language processing, natural language uh, processing, that's a tough task in itself. So now I was taking a skill. I thought, oh, I'm, I'm proficient in programming. I just use this skill to build on my language learning. But it turns out, oh, I hit a point where I now need to learn more about the technical and the programming side. So it keeps going back and forth about what I have to learn and how I have to get better in multiple domains. 
and connecting those uh, really makes it stick more. Now, my examples will be different for everyone else in here. Right? You have to pick those connections that are meaningful to you. But no matter what you do, it's really important at the end to always reflect and be thinking about this process. I mentioned the word metacognition before and thinking about thinking. Well, come back to it and actually think about it. What did I do? What did I learn? What are my goals? Did I accomplish them? Should I change my goals? Right? Explicitly make those connections and think more and more about um, what you're learning and how you're learning it. Right? Uh, you know, an idea popped in my head when I was watching that, that talk earlier about, uh, about deep learning, about dropout. Um, how sometimes in a neural network, the, um, you have a, a neuron, it's too good. And then everyone gets, the other neurons get lazy and just depend on that good neuron. So a technique in computer science, well, okay, well, let's take that neuron out of my network, train all the other ones. Now they can't think about, or they can't rely on that really good one. So you could use that when you're learning a new skill. Like, you know, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make this program, which maybe it's really easy, it's in my boring zone, but what if I limit myself? I have to do it in a, uh, in a functional way instead of you know, an iterative approach. So something that might seem really easy, making a to-do list, yeah, okay, that might be easy for you. Have you done it, you know, taking a functional approach, thinking about it in a different paradigm? So you can take the boring stuff and make it fun again by putting constraints on yourself. Okay, so that's about it. Just want to summarize everything we've talked about here. Uh, Python's a great tool for learning programming and computer science, but you can do things to make your learning experience even better. One of those, take a look more into test-driven development, which I didn't really give you a whole lot on, but I'll give you a resource at the last slide. Um, and also learn more about learning. It's something that can help you no matter what your domain is, what your specialty is. Uh, and find your zone of proximal development. You know, some people phrase this as getting out of your comfort zone. Push yourself to always do new things, uh, to do them better. Always challenge yourself. It's how you have fun, and it's how you grow. Um, Practicing things in a deliberate way and reflecting on them are really effective ways of growing specific skills. Doing those within real world context is even better, right? And then connect all the different things you've learned about, both explicitly by just using skills together you wouldn't think go together, um, but also thinking about connections that you made subconsciously. You're like, oh, really, I was thinking about this like, in a certain way. Uh, so you sometimes subconsciously make connections. And when you make them explicit, they come to the forefront of your mind. Uh, and then you make them stronger just by thinking about them. And always find time for reflection. Here's some tools. Uh, there's a cool course on Coursera for learning how to learn recommend that. Uh, some of these, Replit is a tool that I would have talked about more if there were some educators in the room. It's a pretty neat program that you can have, um, you can create programming challenges of your own and make tests to have an instant feedback system that you can give to students. So it's a pretty cool just online REPL uh, tool. Hacker Rank I mentioned. Kaggle is a pretty cool collection. If you've done data science, you maybe are familiar with this already. It's just an online space for collaborative uh, data science that you can do. And there's the book on test-driven development with Python. The website's host on it. It's called Obey the Goat. If you've ever seen uh, the O'Reilly books with all the different animals on them, the animal on this book happens to be a goat, which is why I'm assuming he chose that name for the website, but just some tools. And that is it. 
Here's my contact info. Uh, are there any questions? What would you suggest for uh, teaching a, a kid for programming or t about computer in general? Uh, how old would the child should be and uh, what would be the ap approach to starting? Thanks. Okay, uh, so to summarize the question, ask, uh, if you want to teach children how to program, uh, I think number one, that motivation is key. So finding something fun. Uh, I, I know an entry point for a lot of younger children nowadays being able to do things like uh, play with a game they like, like Minecraft. You can make mods for that. Um, they have specific tools aimed at, at younger children. Uh, there are also tools like Scratch that make programming more of a game. Right? It's, it's snapping together blocks of code rather than typing it out. So just finding a way that's engaging and fun I think is more important really than the specific content that you throw at them. So if it's fun and it's something they want to do, then they'll learn really fast, I think. Right age. I don't know. You, they have uh, these things called coda pillars that you can, ju they just, uh, it's like a physical computing, right? I have a, a big plax plastic caterpillar I can put together in different orders and the body will like uh, maybe go forward, go right, go left, and it's just different commands. So getting kids thinking about computational programming, you know, just talk through your processes, play board games that involve thinking, because it doesn't have to be actual programming that get, starts getting them into a computing mindset. So I think there's no, no cert, certain age. Yeah. Time. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, sorry. Um, so, um, I, I may have missed it, but then uh, you do actually teach programming to kids as well, right? Yes, I teach uh, computer science programming to grades 6 through 12. Okay. Um, do you um, actually uh, teach the kids while the parents are around uh, at all, or the parents are usually not there? Usually, no. It's, a, it's in a okay. school, so it's, it's okay. me and cool. the students in the classroom. Okay. So um, one, one challenge that I've been having um, in, in, my, in the programming clubs uh, I run, right, mm -hmm. is that uh, parents, ex do, parents expect learning programming to be a hard, grinding work. And when they see kids having fun, they freak out. How do you deal with that? <laughs> Would you have any suggestions? <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely understand that. You know, I'm at an international school where those parents have really high expectations. And, and yeah, that phenomenon occurs. I think really showing the power of what they can do is really important. So um, I usually lead with a demo of something like really impressive, right? Maybe that I wrote that I don't expect them to get all the way there. But they're like, wow, that's cool. And I'm like, yeah, and now you're going to engage in the skills you need to make something like this. They don't end up with that necessarily by the end, but they say, oh, this is, this is a real skill that can lead me to something like that. Okay. So I think that's one approach. Okay. Well, the, uh, the issue, issue I have is that, okay, well, maybe with Python, something like that, that is okay, but then with, with, with the kids are a bit younger and they start with Scratch, and then uh, the, the parents think, why, why is my kid creating a game? And it's very difficult to communicate um, that it's, it's a good s stepping stone. Yeah, uh, uh, but definitely a tough issue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, same thing. There's really cool things that people have done in Scratch. Uh, um, so finding the most impressive demos you can, like, look at this stuff. I mean, sometimes maybe a, a student might be a little let down if you so, show them something way beyond what you're going to be doing in the class. So there's a double-edged sword there. You don't want to be like, you know, look at this, this video game that took hundreds of people years to make. I'm going to give you the skills to make that. It's like, well, no, not, not in an afternoon coding club for four weeks. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so there, there's a balance there of the motivation. And, and, you know, sometimes just communicating and talking with the parents about, uh, explicitly about the skills you're teaching and how they can be applied could be beneficial. All right. Thank you. Yep.